Hello uh, everyone and uh, this is Peter Swidler again with a uh, highlight video for Game 3 of the World Championship match uh, between Magnus uh, Carlsen and Fabiano Caruana and uh, Game 3 was uh, reasonably quiet. Uh, there was still enough there to keep us interested in the studio and as usual Alexander Grishuk uh, provided a lot of uh, really excellent suggestions uh, over the board and also a lot of uh, uh, very nice anecdotes and uh, general uh, goodwill feeling. So if you're not watching the live streams, I feel you're missing out because this is, uh, uh, if I say so myself, excellent material in particular because Alexander is here. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, there was one critical moment in the game and after that it kind of uh, fizzled out. So let's uh, let's start looking at what happened. Uh, just as in game one, uh, Fabiano opened by playing e4, c5, knight of 3 knight c6, bishop b5, g6, takes, takes, d3, bishop g7. We're still following uh, what happened in game one up to this point, and here Fabiano deviated from uh, the move h3 that he made in game one and played uh, castles, which is, I feel, uh, a less popular move in terms of uh, amount of practice or perhaps uh, a less popular move in, in terms of the amount of uh, high level practice but still of course a very natural and a very uh, normal uh, choice to which Magnus more or less instantly replied by Queen C7 a move which I honestly still don't entirely understand I'm not quite sure what this is aimed against it felt to us that it was uh, uh, a bit of a waiting choice it's uh, it's a non-committal decision uh, slightly perhaps improving uh, the position of this piece until you settle on whether you want to play e5 knight e7 or e5 knight f6, uh, protecting the pawn on e5 for the future. I guess that probably is the point of queen c7, as we will see in a couple of moves' time. But obviously there is plenty of options available to black which are not queen c7, and uh, it already showed, I believe, that uh, uh, Tim Carlson paid some attention to six castles because you don't play the move, uh, the, the move like this without uh, having looked at this position in some depth. Uh, Fabiano played rook e1, black played e5, and here white switched to uh, this sort of old school plan of pushing uh, a3 and b4 and hoping to achieve something on the queen side uh, by putting pressure on black. Uh, to do something about the uh, hanging pawn on c5, as we will see. And uh, one explanation for queen c7 probably is if black plays e5 immediately, white can play a3. And for white, the fact that the rook is on uh, e1 is not that important, but for black, in particular, if he wants to play knight f6 here, the fact that the pawn on e5 is not hanging is uh, quite beneficial. So I guess that would be my off the cuff explanation for why queen c7 was played on move 6. Rook e1, e5, a3, knight f6, b4, and black just castled here. Uh, all this was played uh, reasonably quickly by Magnus, and already uh, you can see that he is uh, challenging Fabiano to um, take some interesting and uh, committal decisions as early as move 10 here. And when we finally uh, uh, got on the call with Alexander Grishuk, one of the first things he said about uh, the opening play in this game was that he felt that um, by far the most interesting option available to white uh, early on in the game was just to sort of not believe black and take on c5 here. Black most likely would play knight d7, bishop e3 and f5, creating ideas of f4 and perhaps then knight takes c5. And here Alexander suggested a very interesting move which we did not uh, consider before he appeared. Uh, as a guest on the show, and that move is a3, a4. I clicked around uh, in this position for a bit, and the machine also suggests that something uh, really outlandish, uh, knight g5, knight f6, we, uh, we got to this position uh, with Sopico and didn't, didn't really see how to continue. And the computer just plays bishop c1 here and says h6, knight f3, and um, white provoked some weaknesses. Uh, I think the machine more than anything views this f5 push as a potential weakness on the king side. And the machine quite likes this for white. And also the move that Alexander suggested, which is a3, a4 instead of knight g5, with the idea of replying to f4 with bishop c1, 
knight takes e5 and bishop a3 is also quite interesting. Although here uh, we have this uh, weird situation where the computer assesses uh, a possible position like I will show you in a second, b6, knight bg2, and the machine plays, for instance, rook d8, takes, takes, rook b1, queen e7, knight c4, and g5. And here uh, the computer very calmly plays h3, h5, and knight h2, and gives white, once again, I did not uh, continue clicking here, so perhaps uh, at much greater depth the evaluation would change. But at a reasonable depth, the machine gives white a very large advantage here. But I think from the human viewpoint, yes, the structure on the queen side is quite ruined. But if black ever actually manages to push g5, g4, he will probably give mate on the king side. And if you give mate on the king side, your structural weaknesses on the other side of the board will not matter a great deal. So um, this, I think, is quite playable for black. But uh, once again, it would have been a much different game compared to what we uh, have seen. Instead, Fabiano played knight bd2, to which Magnus uh, could react in a variety of ways, but he chose a reasonably conservative approach because uh, the move he made, bishop g4, it makes perfect sense from the strategic uh, standpoint, so to speak, but uh, despite the fact that this bishop on c8 in many positions would have been a hindrance for black, uh, by giving his um, two bishops advantage, he quite clearly states that he's only really playing to equalize today. Uh, h3 uh, is the most natural reply. We, once again, we entertain the idea of accepting the pawn sacrifice here and playing knight b3. But I believe this position is a much improved version for black compared to what we saw earlier because of the rather un unpleasant pin along the uh, uh, g4, d1 diagonals. And also having not taken on c5 on move 10, it would have been slightly weird for uh, Fabi to take on c5 here, where once again I feel that the best time for that was uh, uh, on the previous move. h3, bishop takes, knight takes. We were trying to take with the uh, with the queen uh, when waiting for Fabi's decision, but I think knight takes is just stronger. Because uh, white, in many positions, will really need the option of playing bishop d2. So I think it's a good decision. And here, uh, black had the option of playing slower for one more move, and play knight d7. And if white makes a very sort of uh, naive move, bishop b3, then black can take, take, and play five, and he is just completely fine. But after knight d7, <clears throat> white should play bishop d2 stopping the counterplay with a7, a5, more or less dead in its tracks. And something along the lines of rook e8, queen b1, and eventually black will have to do it, so let's just do it here for demonstration purposes. Black will be more or less forced to take on b4 eventually, takes, takes a6, g3. Once again, not a required move, but a nice move gaining some space, uh, safeguarding the king a little bit further. And some kind of a position like this is a very typical Rosalima position, which uh, despite looking quite modest, is actually rather unpleasant for black. And um, I'm pretty sure Fabiano would have been very, very happy with the outcome of the opening. And also I feel something like this is very much the reason for uh, the fact that uh, Magnus immediately took on before here and played a5, not really allowing white the time to make sure that uh, the a-pawn doesn't get traded. But here... Uh, white took on a5, rook takes a5, and this is the one turning point where, which I mentioned in my uh, short uh, uh, introductory statement. Uh, Fabi quite, quite quickly played the move bishop d2 here, after which he is still somewhat better, but I feel that the moment he realized that he made a bit of a misstep here, he also kind of uh, lost some part of an interest in the game, and he did not really at least judging by his plate, he did not really believe uh, he will uh, have large winning chances. But had he started with rook takes a5 instead, queen takes a5 and bishop d2, he would have had a very, very nice position. Black more or less has to play queen c7 here, queen a1, knight d7, and here white has a choice between going uh, immediately playing queen a7, creating some pressure on the queen side, or playing slower, playing something like rook b1, and for instance if black plays b5, we can play queen a3, make sure we assume total control over the a file, and after bishop f8 we can play queen c3 
and start combining ideas of, let's say, uh, bishop e3 followed by rook a7. In some positions, maybe you can start pushing the h-pawn, trying to uh, get some committal decisions from black in reply. And in general, uh, white is quite clearly uh, exerting a decent amount of pressure here because black's pieces are uh, not as well coordinated. And most importantly, white is pretty much in control of the only open file on the board. Uh, but after bishop d2, of course, Magnus did not need a second invitation not to abandon the a-file, and he played rook 5 f uh, a8. And from this moment onwards, uh, our feeling in the studio was that having been given this uh, this breathing room by uh, the somewhat uncharacteristic, uh, uncharacteristic Fabi uh, misstep, Magnus will not really relinquish control and he shouldn't lose. And as a matter of fact, he even... Uh, pressed for a little bit later in the game. Queen b1, 97, and here the next two moves are in particular somewhat strange looking because uh, the queen, it feels like it should go to either b3 or b2 to have uh, potential support uh, in, in the fight for the a-file. For instance, something like bishop b3, b5, queen b3, rook fb8, for instance, and rook a2 looks very natural in a position like this. And it probably means that white will with the loss of some time and uh, in a slightly worse edition than had he taken on a5 on move 15, but he will still probably assume control over the a-file. And black will still have to defend a somewhat unpleasant position. It's not really that great for black at all. Queen b4 is really, I'm not entirely sure what the queen is doing on that square. Black quite naturally played rook f8. And in particular, the next move, uh, I don't really have a particularly good uh, good explanation for. Once again, the natural play for white is something like rook e b1, b5, bishop b3, bishop f8, queen c3, queen d6. And then you make some kind of a waiting move like g3, you play king g2. And black still needs to be somewhat accurate because the bishop on f8 is kind of stupid. The knight on d7 is quite passive. And... Uh, yes, the A-file is now uh, not under White's control, but White still retains reasonable amounts of pressure, although Black should, I think, with precise play, hold this position. But instead of all that, uh, Fabi put the bishop on c3, where it really doesn't feel like it belongs, and immediately uh, Black played b5. And uh, the one explanation I have for bishop c3, maybe, is that Fabi, when he played that move, felt that b5 is more or less impossible because after takes takes, he can play queen e7, creating a actual threat against the e5 pawn. But here black uh, needs to calculate only one variation. It's not a very difficult one. He goes bishop f6. Now there's this very nice tactic, bishop takes e5. But despite the fact that black loses the central pawn, it's just a draw takes, takes queen d7, and after rook a1, black has enough, enough count to play uh, against the white pawns. In particular, a very nice move which uh, Sopico demonstrated during the live show was after king f1, which is by far the most uh, critical try from white in this position. Black can take, take, and without even giving any checks, black can play queen c5 here. Uh, attacking the pawn on c2, and you cannot really protect it because then you're giving up your uh, entire king side with checks. Even that position probably is a draw, but black really isn't risking very much here at all. So uh, Fabi had an option here of um, just making a more or less forced draw by playing queen e7, but he played rook a1 instead, perhaps thinking that he can still press a little bit in this endgame, but Magnus uh, took, took and played queen a7, and it turned out that uh, it is the black queen that uh, potentially is the more active of the two, and after bishop c3, queen a2, uh, Fabiano played queen b2, mm, signaling uh, a, a complete stop to uh, any hopes for advantage, and uh, in fact he even had to defend this position a little bit. And uh, perhaps he felt that uh, queen a7, queen a2 is too ambitious and queen e7 is quite strong here. But um, careful examination shows that after queen takes c2, white needs to play quite precisely to make a draw. And the computer says uh, the position after uh, queen takes d7, queen takes c3, queen e8, check, bishop f8, and knight takes e5 is in fact a draw. 
but it's very difficult to decide to go for something like this because for instance here you're a pawn down and you still need to play uh, reasonably precisely and not not to lose this position so it's understandable that Fabi didn't want to do any of that he played queen b2 takes takes f6 king f1 king f7 king e2 knight c5 and for instance here uh, to my slight surprise or maybe even more than slight surprise uh, the machine says it makes decent sense to play g uh, sorry bishop c3 is what fabiano played but uh, the computer suggests that playing g4 and after knight e6 playing d3 d4 is the easiest way to make an immediate draw uh, because uh, e takes d4 knight takes d4 uh, there will be mass simplifications and a draw and in case of knight f4 check king e3 there is enough counter play against the e5 pawn not to have to worry that the h3 pawn is about to fall but it's not a very natural way to do from a human standpoint from a human standpoint you you don't really even necessarily feel that you're worse here so fabi made a couple of uh, autopilots move autopilot moves in a row here he played bishop c3 knight e6 g3 stopping knight f4 check bishop f8 and here he played knight d2 and uh the reply to all this by Magnus was called by our co-host uh, Alexander Grishuk, the first really brilliant move of the match. I don't know how much of that was tongue-in-cheek, but I think it's a very nice idea. Magnus spent two tempi provoking h3, h4 in this position so that he could uh, fix that pawn on a dark square. And now you can arguably maybe have some hope of winning some uh, bishop endings in some very very distant future because the pawn on h4 might become a target for some play with i don't know g6 g5 later on but of course it is still a, a six against six uh, uh end game with only two light pieces on the board and you don't have to be very very precise here to hold with white and fabiano managed quite uh quite comfortably he played bishop d2 bishop d6 c2 c3 the move uh that is not really required but it doesn't spoil anything c5 bishop e3 king e7 uh king g1 king g7 king c2 we were somewhat critical of that idea during the live show because we felt that black probably should start something on the king side here but as as mentioned uh the margins are reasonably large here and it's not that easy for black to create something magnus did push f5 and after king g1 uh, the computer suggests that maybe um, a somewhat counterintuitive move b5 b4 because in general black does not want to place his pawns on uh, the squares uh, the dark squares is, uh, because his bishop is a dark square bishop but here in particular b4 followed for instance after king c2 by f4 and then g5 opens up this you know really really long uh, front line trying to create some weaknesses on the king side that you can maybe potentially exploit later but even this position i'm pretty sure uh white holds if he doesn't lose his head and doesn't st doesn't start doing uh really stupid things instead of all that magnus went for a change of structure which optically looks very nice he took on e4 and played c4 92 and this is move 39 so it's understandable that magnus decided to put Fabi to the test, so to speak, and uh, give him uh, for move 40 for the final, I think, maybe five minutes that Fabi had in this position, a choice of whether he wanted to give up his bishop or allow this knight to land on d3 or a4, one of those squares. But Fabi was very equal to this task. He took on c5, uh, bishop takes c5, king e2, knight c6, sorry, king c6, and here Fabi thought for quite a bit and played uh, knight f1, which prompted more or less an immediate uh, uh, forced draw sequence from Magnus because as we realized in the studio if you allow knight e3 and actually go into that pawn ending game that pawn end game is uh, quite seriously better for white and if black holds it it's only by miracle so black needs to uh, do something about the impending arrival of the knight on d5 and Magnus played b4 takes takes knight e3 king c5 and here many things lead to a draw, including what Fabi played. f4, takes, takes, bishop a5, f5, gf. And here the final, I don't know if you can call it finesse, knight takes c4, king takes c4, ef5. And uh, because the uh, remaining uh, pawn on the board is 
the promotion square is not uh, the correct color. As we all know, the dark squared bishop with the h pawn does not win for black, so uh, the game was agreed drawn uh, in this position. So, as mentioned, uh, a reasonably quiet game, but uh, the theoretical discussion in the uh, in the Rosalimo continues. And uh, I'm, I'm very certain that uh, uh, the opening battle was won quite convincingly by uh, Team Caruana uh, in Game 3. However, uh, the one careless decision in Move 15, the choice of playing Bishop D2 instead of Rook takes A5, more or less put paid to uh, any winning attempt that uh, Fabiano could mount today. And uh, he still needed to even maybe defend a little bit uh, uh, before before the game was eventually drawn. So, uh, as usual, it's possible to find positive for both both sides, but a very different game to game one, where Magnus was sort of in control throughout and uh, Fabio was very lucky to escape. Tomorrow is uh, game four. Magnus will once again be white, uh, and it's very, very interesting to, to see what he will come up with uh, uh, considering the events of game two, where he played uh, a very, very mainline variation of Queen's Gambit declined and ran into some very specific preparation, which more, more or less immediately solved uh, all of uh, Fabiano's problems. Uh, Alexander Grishuk, live on air, uh, stated that he believes uh, contesting uh, this exact tabia, the, uh, the d4, knight of 6, c4, e6, let's say, knight of 3, d5, knight c3 tabia, that we saw in game two, uh, that contesting that against uh, uh, Fabiano and his team is uh, perhaps not the wisest decision for uh, for Magnus because it kills uh, some of his edges uh, that he has arguably over Fabiano in in play in playing let's say the early middle game, and we'll see tomorrow if uh, Magnus and and his team uh, agrees with that assessment. And with this, uh, I will probably wrap this this up. Uh, thank you for watching. This has been Peter Swidler for Chess 24 with post-game analysis of Game 3 of the World Championship match. And tomorrow, same time, same place, uh, come join us uh, in uh, watching and talking about Game 4. Until then, uh, see you. Bye.